Hello, I'm Dennis Ferris, and welcome to the Limitless Energy Podcast. And today I'm here with Al Thomason uh, of the Thomason Jones Company, the mastermind behind the WakeSpeed brand. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is pretty significant for us because WakeSpeed represents uh, the first significant acquisition for Dragonfly Energy. So welcome to the program here, Al. Well, thank you, Dennis. It's a pleasure to be here this, this morning. So in, in light of the, the acquisition, uh, Dragonfly acquired the assets last spring. Um, I just wanted to talk to you about what it meant to you, what it felt like as an entrepreneur growing this company, growing this brand, and then going through this acquisition process. Yeah, well, I gotta tell you, um, it was very exciting. I mean, you know, the Wake Speed product, the Wake Speed brand, we have been humbled by how it's been adopted and accepted by the industry. We obviously had something of value. We grew so fast on our own as Thomas and Jones that we were really at the point of facing to have to expand, you know, people, facilities, and Dragonfly reached out to us and uh, through the uh, great conversations, we saw a great opportunity to accomplish a lot of the growth without us having to do it ourselves and then also to join with a really great partner. Uh, from a personal standpoint, I've come more from the private sector and I've seen acquisitions. I've always been on the other side. <laughs> this is the first time for an entrepreneurial to, to have it uh, an acquisition. And it, it really has been kind of rewarding, frankly, to have people recognize. Right. Well, your your reputation preceded you. Obviously, Dragonfly was looking for these this capability. Uh, and uh, Wakespeed had a fantastic reputation in, in the market, both in the RV markets and in the marine markets. So let's talk a little bit about the origins of Wakespeed. So you, you actually came, as you <clears throat> noted, from the private sector, yeah. retired, and then became an entrepreneur. So how did that pan out? Oh, boy, I tell you, it's like many things in life. The life leads you, right? So uh, by choice, if we go way back during my summer jobs in school, one of the companies I worked for, um, uh, individual, big stack of money, retired, died two years later, and I thought that was nuts. So I had a personal goal to retire early, and we accomplished that. Wife and I, we sold everything, we moved on an old wooden trawler, and we started cruising the Pacific Northwest and up the Inside Passage up in Canada and Alaska. And that's what we did. I mean, we were away from the docks in the springs. We'd leave, and we'd go north, and we saw people, we'd go more north. 100% energy independent, 100% resource independent. We'd come in once a month right to get provisions so through that whole experience because my background I'm actually degreed in computer science and electronic engineering I'm really curious about what's going on with the charging system and I found that the system that all the glossy magazines told me to put in wasn't working correctly it sort of worked but it really didn't work correctly it didn't fully charge the batteries and if we were just away for a weekend it wouldn't have mattered but we're away a month at a time so it really mattered to make sure you had the batteries that were charged correctly and the biggest lacking that we found was the uh, missing of the battery current. So that's how the wake speed came about as technology. Create the product that monitor the battery current and I let the batteries tell me when they're fully charged and what their needs are rather than trying to guess at it. So this, I, this is part of the secret of wake speed success really because you were living the life yeah. and you saw the need. It's, it's not like you were trying to get into a market or something. You were living the life. You are living on the boat, trying to understand how to live off of your the energy resources that you had, and you saw a glaring need in the process. So can you talk a little bit about that need that you identified? Yeah, 10 years we're living that, and I'm not going to suffer living for 10 years. And like I say, the biggest difference is we listen to the battery. And, and it actually goes beyond that when we get into the more later systems, but even but back then the real thing was you listen to the acceptance. The battery will tell you what it wants, but you have to pay attention to the voltage, temperature, and current. And that was the technical detail that was missing. Most of the glossy magazine charging systems out there, alternate based charging systems, they didn't do that. They had other ways of accomplishing it, and they worked okay. But they really, really didn't fully charge the battery. They didn't properly maintain the batteries, you'd lose lifespan. I mean, it's just a whole bunch of issues. That was the first and fundamental difference. Now, as we move on, I don't know if you want to talk about this now, but as we move on into later days with the adoption of the lithium batteries, because this, this original battery was a forklift battery. It weighed 2,000 pounds, and it, I had to pull ballast out of the boat when I put it in, right? But now when we move forward to the lithium technologies, that listening to the battery concept is even more important. 
So we do things like we'll instrument the battery fully. If we're, we're like with drop-in batteries, we have some support with that. But if we have the ability to communicate with BMSs, that lets us even listen more closely with the battery to this needs and status. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you don't ever have to ask if I'm willing to talk about lithium batteries. <laughs> I'm, I'm always willing to talk about that. But yeah. um, so, so it, this is an interesting point here. So you started out with big lead acid batteries and you basically saw issues with charging those from the alternator. Those issues became even more prominent when you switched over to lithium. So specifically for the big lead acid batteries, you're, you're out you know, on the water for a month at a time or whatever. What, would, what made it clear to you that you needed a change in how you were doing the charging from the alternator? There's a, there's a product out there called a, a Link 10 that is a battery monitor. And being the curious type of guy, I've actually broken the Link 10, pressing the little button to see what's going on with the battery. You're a true engineer. I'm a true engineer, and I, I'm bored. I'm retired, right? <laughs> I'm not there. I'm not in the office designing things anymore. So literally, I'm watching the battery to see what's going on while it's trying to charge. And what I discovered is this thing would go into float prematurely. It wouldn't fully charge the battery. So you asked the question, what prompted me to actually create this technology? On our first shakedown cruise, we're going up the Columbia River, not charging the battery, and we're trying to live off this thing. Literally, I stopped the boat in the middle of the Columbia River, turned the engine off, turned it on again to try to restart the charge cycle, because it would go for a period of time and pour more energy into the battery. That's just nuts. I mean, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to crawl into the engine room and unplug the regular harness and plug it in or turn the engine off. I'm just not going to do that. So that particular product failed. When I got back from the shakedown cruise, I did what's known as a float test. And by the way, the product failed the float test as well. I had previously made a DC generator that had a part of it as an alternator regulator. I just pulled that out, made it a standalone alternator regulator. So you're definitely a tinkerer. Yeah. So that, you know, you're, you're, how would you recommend to folks that actually want to get out of the water and live this type of lifestyle who aren't necessarily tinkerers? I mean, you're, you're able to solve the problem while you're out on the water. Yeah. You know, so how, I, I guess maybe that spurred you to try to create a solution for folks that aren't tinkerers. Is, is that accurate to say? Well, that's where we ended up at. And, and, and the short answer to your question is buy awake speed. I mean, we've got the product, right? Um, but yeah, that leads into your real question. So as time moved forward, I met a gentleman by the name of Rick Jones, and he and I started uh, Thomas & Jones Company with the brand of Wake Speed Offshore. That's where the Wake Speed 500 came from. I took my tinkerer project, if you will, we commercialized it, put it in a, a better box, and you know, all the documents go around it, and we started offering it for sale. Uh, Rick is a brilliant guy. He actually has a lot of experience in the industry. He, you know, worked for some glossy magazine companies, and you can look on their website and see his history. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he and I formed Wake Speed, and that's really how stuff started. So you and Rick are pretty different personalities. Can oh. can you can you talk a little bit about how that worked in in an entrepreneurship scenario, and you grew this company together? Yeah, we are definitely different people. Uh, I think the easiest way to describe it that most people might get, he's an Apple guy, I'm a Windows guy, right? <laughs> um, in terms of how we work together, we actually, it was a great synergy. Uh, we both understand the industry. We focused primarily from the market of the uh, marine industry, but to be frank, the RV industry is what, picked the, what had the most interest. About that time frame, I'm kind of sidelining a little bit, about that time frame, lithium batteries, and specifically 48 volt lithium batteries, were starting to become uh, utilized. It was the early edge for it. Our product had the capability to do 48 volts out of the box. We didn't have to change anything, it was designed that way. And it also had the capability of treating lithium batteries correctly. So really, we found most of our adoption into the uh, RV market space. And this is where Rick and I really kind of uh, worked well together. He's very much more on the relationship, the uh, sales, the, the marketing side. I'm much more on the technical side. So between us, and we also find that very often we're kind of like a married couple in the sense that we have a very common view. It's very rare that we have a different opinion on how we should move forward on things. So right. it actually worked really well, and we've become great friends throughout this whole process. Well, it's funny when 
our interaction with Wake Speed started with Rick. Mm -hmm. he, he was the people guy. He's the one that we actually saw at trade shows and uh, was the vocal one. And then I got to know you through the subcommittees on the the RVIA or you know some of these standards committees. And what I noticed about you was that you were also very vocal in in an engineering sense, and you were very familiar um, with requirements with standards and the development of those standards and especially the coding and how you actually develop the the uh, the the programs and the uh, baseline to, to accomplish what the uh, organizations needed um, so maybe you can talk a little bit, bit about why you have that background because you you did start off was it at IBM you started out or at least no. spent some time there no, I spent time at IBM, but that was later in my career. Okay. My first career uh, was a systems programmer. I wrote uh, languages. I wrote databases. I didn't write things in languages. I actually wrote the language itself. Um, my, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a dual degree computer science and electronic engineering. My passion is actually embedded control. That's something I've always enjoyed doing. So I'd, I'd rather make the microwave oven beep than write an app application for airline reservation. Right. That's just how I've been in the beginning. My senior project, I wrote an operating system for a Kim One computer. Right. So that's kind of what my background was. Um, as I go through my career path, I started out as a systems programmer. Worked for a variety of companies. I worked for uh, Seiko Epson for a period of time. I worked for a telco company, a large telco, uh, computer switches, ancillary product, voicemail number forwarding. Um, IBM, you mentioned. At that time, I had kind of moved into the marketing aspect, product marketing, portfolio. This is where I got a lot of standards positions. Uh, I also was, I had a manager tell me once I was pretty effective working with engineering. And the reason was because most of my contemporaries came up through business school. I had the technical background. So I could work with engineers and I could also tell when they were trying to snow me. So when I look at stuff, uh, I'm a believer in open standards. You'll notice the Wake Seed product uses open standards, RVC, J1939, you know, CIA 303. We use op utilize open standards. We publish our standards. And then it also has that kind of combination of hardware and software for the embedded control. So this is great for the industry in terms of uniformizing the systems, but I think it highlights the importance of the systems. So we, at, Dra at Dragonfly, obviously we're a lithium ion battery company. We develop technologies for lithium ion batteries, we sell lithium ion batteries, but now it's becoming more of a systems approach, really. So we're developing full systems for your RV, for your boat. So wake speed features prominently in that uh, concept. Um, so Obviously, communication is important, but maybe you can talk about the importance of uh, the system's approach to developing a really robust product for the customer. You know, I think I was counting the number of times you words, used the word system in that question. And I'm really pleased to hear it because it's something I've been talking about for a very, very long time. If we go back in the day, if we go back 20 years when we had the lead acid batteries, lead acid batteries, you know, it's a very, long technology and they're rather forgiving you could put together a system lead acid system with components discrete components and largely it would work because you know the battery could take a lot of abuse when we get into the lithium and more so when we get into high energy lithium which i personally define as anything that has 3000 watt or higher alternator head and we're doing a lot of 5000 watt even 10,000 watt charging systems when you get into these higher energy deployments and lithium ion based battery systems, you really do have to look at it as a system. Everything has to be designed to work with each other, has to be configured and deployed to work with each other. You could get away with a lot of stuff when you had just a 100 amp alternator and a 12 volt couple of golf cart batteries. You just can't have that level of casualty today. It really truly has to be a system product from end to end. Well, we've worked hard to create batteries that will work in all kinds of different scenarios. Obviously, it's important for us to be able to offer a product for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've had to make it as foolproof as possible. But it is exciting for us to actually make and sell full systems. And WakeSpeed manages the interaction between 
the alternator and the rest of the system. So let's talk about alternator charging. Alternator charging is critical in an RV because you drive to your destination, you expect your batteries to be full so that you can immediately start living off your batteries. Similar for a boat, right? So um, maybe you can talk about the pitfalls associated <laughs> with trying to charge a battery specifically with an alternator. Yeah. Um, as that, if you go and look, just so you know, there's a lot of effort that goes into making sure this stuff works from the wake speed standpoint. And like if you go to the wake speed website, you'll see there's a list of about 15 different battery manufacturers that we advertise we support. And that's because we've taken the time to create a system and make sure it actually works. Some of the details, the biggest detail with alternator based charging system is uh, uh, what's known as a load dump. So lithium ion batteries have a battery management system in it, BMS. Its job in life is to protect the battery. And if it gets upset enough, it will disconnect the battery. That is known in the industry as a load dump, and it could be a catastrophic event. You can, there's, well, you can look on the websites and you can find more details about this, but it's something you want to avoid. You want to make sure you have protection for it. That's probably the single biggest difference that you have to pay attention to from an alternator based charging system. You want to make sure that you can avoid that from happening. So you want to make sure your charge profiles are correct. You want to make sure you're instrumenting the battery correctly so that you know what's going on with the battery and you stay away from that third rail if you want, if you will. You want to make sure that you have a knowledge of what the battery is going to do, either a real time knowledge through a communication or, or like in the case of some of the drop ins where we don't have that engineering to engineering level interaction. So that both wake speed and the battery manufacturer, we both know exactly what's going to happen with that battery and become stressed. And then we can manage a charge profile process to avoid that, to stay away from there. That's the type of stuff I'm talking about. That's the engineering approach from a system standpoint. That's the additional need that we're at with these high energy lithium ion installs. Great. Yeah, I love it. I mean, obviously load, load dumps or the possibility of load dumps is something we've been familiar with for years. Um, we've had to address it with our products through redundancy. You, you've got multiple BMSs. They're not all shutting off all at the same time. Mm -hmm. You can at least uh, mitigate the, the risk. But ultimately, the most foolproof solution, especially in a high voltage system, which is becoming way more prevalent, is the wake speed solution. We want to be able to monitor and discharge the energy from the alternator before there is a cutoff. As you described it, it could be potentially catastrophic. So can we talk a little bit about what that what that failure looks like? It's there, So you have a voltage spike, then what happens? Yeah, so uh, this is a well-known phenomenon. It was, the, it was discovered back in the 50s and 60s by the automotive industry when they moved from generators to alternators. And they define the load dump. Load dump is defined as the battery being disconnected when an alternator is active. And back in the day, it typically happened because maybe the fire department had to cut the battery cable, or more likely because of poor maintenance on your car. And you had corroded cables, and you went over a railroad track, and you got that disconnect. And in a 12-volt system, I mean, the, the industry is now an ISO spec. Uh, it is defined as a uh, test pattern of a 100-volt spike in the 12 volt system. 200 volts for, you know, it keeps multiplying and going up. It's absolutely a traumatic event. And there are mitigations for it in the alternators. There's suppression devices, there's external ones, there's keeper batteries. There, there, again, you know, the readers or the listeners can go on the web and look at, you know, different approaches for it. But that's why low dump is. It's not something that's new recently. It's been known for decades. It's become more of an issue because when we look at lithium batteries, because we have this battery manager system in there, and because lithiums are less, the technology of lithium, and you can answer this a lot better than I can, but because the chemistry of lithium is less tolerant to being stressed, whereas a lead acid battery might boil the water off, lithium battery, bad things can happen, you know, damage the cell or, or other things. That BMS introduces the, the higher probability or potential for doing a disconnect. And that's why this whole concept of load dump has really revisited as lithium batteries are being adopted more and more with alternator based charging systems. Well, I think it does highlight the importance of 
of a systems approach. I'll say it again for you. Thank you. Um, I, I, I think it highlights the importance because whether you have a lead acid battery or a lithium battery, there are situations that can create um, an event, you know, whether it's a catastrophic event or an event that shuts down your power or something. That's what needs to be avoided. That's where the design of the system is critical. Um, and that's where, you know, obviously we, we've been really working hard to try to uh, be on the forefront. The wake speed acquisition is a, is a very big part of that. So the other thing, moving from lead acid to lithium batteries, and this might be viewed as a great thing, lithium batteries charge a lot faster. Yes. What are the implications of that for an alternator? You know, I mentioned, uh, not necessarily an alternator, but for the system, right? Uh, I mentioned early on that we had, wake speed had great adoption in the RV space. A lot of our early adapters were lithium systems with 48 volts. And the value prop was, you can run, you can be dry camping all day, start your van up for 20 minutes, 30 minutes in the morning and recharge that battery. And that's all you need. You don't need a generator. You don't need to like dry for hours. It's that fast recharging um, that is a great value prop. We can put alternators now, you can get 24 volt alternators that are four or five K watts, very common, you know, 150, 200, 250 amp, 48 volt alternator. You can get uh, 24 volt alternators. You can get 48 volt alternators, very common in 150 amp range. So now we're looking at six K watt. We were at a trade show and one of our partners had a 48 volt, 300 amp alternator. All right, this is a 15 K watt head. Uh, of course, we were doing rock, paper, scissors to figure out who had to actually schlep it out of the trade show. And I'd often pull the old card, so <laughs> I didn't have to do it. But we're finding alternators are available to do much more power generation and that quicker recharge time. And it's gonna become more and more important. It's not just a lifestyle thing that you only have to start your engine for 30 minutes, but it's also a, a economy thing. Um, you can, while you're doing motivation, while you're while you're actually moving the vehicle, the in incremental energy draw to drive that alternator is in a position, it's in a state where the engine's much more fuel efficient than like if you're using a dedicated generator and you're only running at that 20% load through classically inverter chargers. You've got state initiatives like California that's precluding the use of dedicated generators. So this is a multifaceted transition we're in. It's a very exciting time where we're moving from, if you will, traditional generator-based, you know, long charge times to systems that can deploy lifestyles. You know, I carried on back on my boat, I carried over 2,000 pounds of lead-ass batteries because I didn't want to listen to a generator. I was pretty rare. We'd go and anchor out somewhere, somebody'd pop in with a big boat and they'd fire their generator up for a couple hours in the morning, a couple hours in the evening. That was the norm, right? I didn't want that. Our solution was we pulled anchor and went away. We went somewhere else. But people don't want that. They want to be able to enjoy their morning coffee without listening to kind of this classical approach. And that's where these new lithium batteries and the high output alternators really are coming into play. You got a lifestyle aspect. You've also got kind of an energy efficiency aspect because as mentioned, those generators at light loads, they're gonna burn four times the amount of fuel to make that, that electrical energy versus incremental energy onto the, onto the car itself. And then you've got government regulations that are pushing. These are all kind of aspects that are coming in play that I believe is driving the, the interest into these higher energy, largely you know, lithium ion based systems. I think we agree. Yeah, I think we share this this view that it's about lifestyle, but it's also about energy efficiency. And uh, we're we're definitely very environmentally conscious uh, at Dragonfly, um, but we don't want to have to sacrifice lifestyle. You know, you you want to be able to go out and an RV. You want to be able be able to go out and be on your boat. And there are high power activities, you know, whether you, you've got audio systems or whether you have, um, you know, large appliances on your boat, on your RV, it's important to be able to go out and enjoy um, the experience. That's, that's what we do. But, but we're smart enough to be able to figure out how to do it in an energy efficient manner. So I do, you know, respect what you're saying and, and appreciate that. So you retired once at some point 
You're going to retire again. Oh, yeah. You going to go back on the boat? Uh, the boat's a big part of it. Um, right now, uh, Viking Star is, uh, there's a reason. That's they, the name of your boat? It is. Hmm. It is, Viking Star. Uh, it's a 60-year-old wooden Monk McQueen trawler. Very classic and, you know, efficient, seaworthy, uh, has a lot of good characteristics. And, and, and right now, she is incredibly angry at me because haven't been paying attention to her. Where is she? Uh, up in Friday Harbor, where, where I live. And that was unfortunate. I'm old and cantankerous enough that at the acquisition, I could say, yeah, this is great. Thank you, but I'm not moving. <laughs> and you accommodated it, so I appreciate that. But yeah, I mean, we have to do some maintenance on Viking Star and get her back up to Spiff. And, and my wife and I are still will be a part of our lives at some point, you know, either weekends or maybe we'll do longer longer trips and stuff that's uh that's all in the future there's a lot of other fun stuff to happen between now and then but uh guarantee you one thing i need to start paying attention to viking star a bit well we're gonna have some fun uh before you go back on the boat uh developing systems making the experience better especially when you are you know when you do make that decision to go back and live on the boat again um which i hope you do because all of this work that we're doing is going to make that pan out a lot easier for you. Well, I'm looking forward to get back on the boat and testing some of these exciting systems. I know we can't really talk about stuff in the future, but uh, <laughs> I'm really excited. And, uh, you know, Viking Star is going to be a great test bed. I know a lot of people talk about the sprinters, but you know, fully energy independent. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to not having two and a half you know, thousand pounds of batteries and replacing it with just about 300 pounds and getting the same, same usage out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Al, it's a pleasure having you in the company uh, and Rick. Um, it's so much fun, you know, assimilating wake speed and, and really focusing on these, on these systems and doing more product development, more than we would have otherwise. And uh, it's great to have you on the podcast. Well, appreciate it. Thank you very much. And it's wonderful to be part of the Dragonfly team. I'd like to give a special thanks to my guest today, Al Thomason. Be sure to subscribe to the Limitless Energy podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms.